been in a series called Back to the Basics. Everybody say Back to the Basics. And uh, remember, you can go online and catch Pastor Walt's uh, online uh, campus there where he, he's kind of laid all these, the, the series out and some of that stuff. So make sure you catch that. But he wanted to kind of take the church into an arena of just getting back to the basics and, 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 and to the fundamental things, come on, the foundational things that, that uh, help us as believers. And so we've talked about the Word. We've talked about discipleship. Uh, Miss Jenna did a great job last week of talking about worship. And, uh, uh, you know, so we've gone through so many of the, these subjects. But today we're going to talk about reaching people for Christ. Everybody say reaching people. And, uh, you know, the Luke, and I'll just launch into it. Luke chapter 19, verse 10 says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. How many of you know that there are still lost people out there? And, uh, and it's our, part of our process or part of our, our expression as, as Christians is not just to be good at praying or good at, good at worshiping or good at giving and those kind of things. Part of being a believer is to let the light of God shine, come on, in places of darkness. And what, what that does is, is, is God never intended for his church to become possession-minded. And, and I was going to get into this later, but I'll just jump right, right into it. That God has a plan. He said he came to seek and to save those who were lost. Uh, Matthew 4.19 says that we're to be fishers of men. And part of that meaning that, come on, that we're a tool in the hand of a carpenter. That we're a tool in the life of Christ. And so God created us to be an expression. He created us to reach people. He created us, listen to me, to make room for the lost. And, and being, being a part of that expression is a powerful thing. Mark chapter 16, verse 15, in the New Living Translation, he said to them, go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And so that's a part of our DNA. Come on, as Christ followers. And so what happens is, is, is in life, it's real easy to know that certain things are available. And it's, re and it's real easy to think about, you know, the process of faith and those kind of things. And and we, and we walk through the motions of life without truly activating something special uh, that God gave us, which is the ability to be a part of reaching people for Christ, right? Which is to let our light shine. And so, you know, I got to thinking about it. We, we bought a boat back in September. And, you know, to be honest with you, I've been in boats. I didn't know, didn't know a whole lot about boats, but, but I'm a, I like to fish. So we bought this boat and I really didn't know how, know how to use it. And and uh, so the only way I know is what dad told me. If you want to learn something, jump knee deep in the middle of it and you'll figure it out, right? What he didn't tell me is sometimes it takes six to eight months, come on, to get to that process. And so we bought a boat, has the right trolling motor, has the right motor, has the right look, has the fresh carpet, all the rods, everything you need to be an effective fisherman. And so the problem is every time I'd go to, to get into the boat, it would take me about 35 minutes to start it. And so I didn't tell you these stories, come on, in the boat. And so we're, we'd, we'd get to the boat dock and, and put it in the water, and I'd sit out there for 35 minutes. There'd be 15 boats come and go out to the best fishing spots because I didn't know one thing, that, that there's a choke built into the key that you have to actually push it in. Come on. And then you turn it, and boom, it starts up. And so I, I process this. So I took a break from, from you know, sitting at boat docks. I, that was a big thing for a while. I, I took a break from that. And decided, hey, I'm going to do some investigation. So I started playing with the boat. I bought some things where you could start it in the yard. And still take me 35 to 40 minutes. And I was like, is it the battery? I'd call friends. Finally, I got on Google. Come on, which isn't my first go-to like most of you. And so I get on Google and come to find out, I found out if you'll push the key in, it chokes it, boom, it starts. And so, I mean, I could start a boat now. It's incredible. But listen to me. But for six to eight months there, I had the right vessel. I had the right tools. The boat looked right. The boat sounded right. The boat would take me to the places I need to go, but I didn't have the power to access the boat, come on, in the way that it was meant to be. But once I learned, come on, there's a certain function and button that you push that releases the power. Come on, now it's a vessel. So all you fishermen better look out, I'm telling you. But here's the process of why it's so important to reach people for Jesus. And I cut my teeth on this. I went into ministry and people were the focus. I didn't get into ministry because I thought suits looked good. I didn't get into ministry because I wanted to be something. I got into ministry because God changed my life. And I knew if he could change me, he could change somebody else. And so we're in this thing following that passion in Christ. And so, but the thing is that there, there's a button, there's a part of our lives when we have a heart and we can catch that heart and compassion 
for other people, come on, that releases something in us that's different, come on, than just sitting at a boat dock. You know, sitting at a boat dock is pretty cool because you have a boat, but it's a whole lot better to be trucking across that lake. And, and, and I, look at, I look at our lives many times, and it's not talked about as much as it was 20 to 30 years ago about winning souls and about reaching people because people are kind of confused on where the world is today. I'm telling you today that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Come on, his power has not left. His ability has not left. And if his people will stand up, come on, somebody, and release the gift that's in us, come on, I'm telling you right now, there's still a lot of people to be reached for Christ in our world today. Everybody say amen. And so I just want to give you some thoughts today on how to activate that. And, and I know we have different types of personalities. You have introverts, you have extroverts. I'm not talking about that today. I'm talking about uh, uh, being willing to operate uh, with Christ. Come on, somebody. Being willing to be, be a voice, being willing to be a friend, being willing to be a helper, being willing to pick somebody up, being willing to take, take time and be available out of your own life. Come on to help somebody else get where they need to be in life. And that's the beauty of the church. And so I'm just going to give you some thoughts today. Number one, uh, you're qualified to impact people for Christ. And, and in order to say that, I've got to go to what the Word says about us. The Scripture says that we're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Come on, somebody. God didn't give us this newness of life for us to just hold on to so that we can say it looks good, or we can, we, we can walk through the process of, of, of acting like Christians. Come on, somebody. He gave us this ability, this newness of life, so that the light of God would shine off, shine off of our life, and we could be a part of saving those who are lost. We can be a part of saving those who are hurting, those that, are, that, that, that life has hit them so hard they don't know how to come out of it, and those that are in pain today, those that need an answer. Come on, the answer is not, not be like me. The answer is, come on, that Jesus went to the cross, gave his life, shed his blood. Come on, somebody. And that we can stand here today and say that we've overcome by the blood of Jesus. That's what Scripture says, that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Our testimony isn't all the bad things that we've done. That's a part of, part of the process. Listen to me, church. We overcome because of the blood of the Lamb. We overcome because Jesus gave his, gave his life and gave his best and took stripes upon his back and shed his blood to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we're an extension of his hand. That The blood of Jesus transform, is part of transforming our lives so that we can be that light to the city. Come on. The scripture says a city on a hill cannot be hidden. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. And you know who that city is? That city is you. If Jesus is in your life, you are a city on a hill, which means the light of God is showing. And it may not look, look like much, come on, in the light, when everything's in the light, but in the darkness, I'm telling you right now, the lost don't run to the darkness. They may for a time, but not very long. The lost will run to the light. And that light, you're a part of that process. Somebody say, it's my job. Say it again, it's my job. And so we're qualified. We're new creations in Christ Jesus. We're the righteousness of God. And listen, God set us in the body. Listen, church, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. I love that Ron Ledbetter in, a, in his video said, there was just something, something in me to step up my game. To, 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 you know, if you look into men's ministry and saw what we did, tonight we have beards and barbecue. But, but his quote was, there's something that God did in me. He stirred me to step up my game. And help men, come on, become who God wants them to be. That's powerful. And so that's what it is. It's a stirring. And many of you are sitting, in there, sitting here today, and you're stirred. You want to make a difference. You want to help other people. And, 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 and you want to get to that place. The problem is we don't always believe we're the righteousness of God. We don't always remember we're new creations, right? And so remember, that. get a hold of this thing. It's not a hard process. I never viewed, you know, when I got saved... I immediately, it's like the same thing happened at the same time. I got saved. I wanted somebody else to get saved. So I started talking to friends about Jesus. And, and one would get saved and another would get saved. And they, they, they would come and say, I don't, know how to, I don't know how to lead other people to Jesus, but I want my family to have this. And so I'd get invited into living rooms and to, to uh, quinceañeras and, you know, anywhere where they were setting somebody else up to get saved. And back then, you know, it, it, it was hard, hardcore, uh, we're, you know, we're going to take you through the process. Do you want to go to heaven or you want to go to hell? You know, you know what I'm talking about. And that, that's how you did it. And so, and then you'd say, well, how do you hope to get to heaven? They'd say, I hope to get to heaven by being good. 
By never sinning, by being perfect. Well, have you ever sinned? Yes. Well, by your own confession, you're not going to heaven. That, that was the, that's how you did it back then. But you could always go back and say, do you believe in the Bible? And they would say, yes. Well, there was your, there was your foundation. Today, what we've discovered is when you ask people, do you believe in the Bible? Not everybody does. And so it changes the perspective of, of how you lead somebody to Christ. Are you with me here today? And so today it's more of a conversation of, of where are you at? What anxieties are you dealing with? Uh, you know, go ahead and, and there's things on the inside people need to talk about. They need to get it out. And so, so being a part of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a witness, so to speak, is a little bit different than it was 20 years ago. Even though Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, a lot of the conversations in people's life aren't as fundamental, come on, as they used to be. And so I asked the guy here all back, well, do you believe in the Bible? He said no. Well, what do you do with that? As a Christian, that, that, that method doesn't work anymore. Are you with me here? But I can be available, and I can, I can walk them through the process, and if they're struggling within their faith, and, 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 you know, and, I, and you're available for the long haul, there's going to be a time. You, we've got to stick around long enough for them to see the light that's on my life. So we're not, we're not trying to rush people to say, hey, you've got to get it all together, together today. Listen, Jesus is still seeking and saving those who are lost, Come on, if it takes five years to walk through somebody, somebody through a process, are we available? That's why the scripture says that you're the ministers of reconciliation, right? And so we're all qualified. And so 2 Corinthians 5.18 says this, really powerful. It says, now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ Jesus and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. You know, uh, Grace talked about it during communion. He's given us the ministry of reconciliation. So look at somebody and say, I'm a minister. Say it loud, I'm a minister. Well, pastor, I just want to go to church. Listen to me. Going to church was never, never just the ingredient, right? We, we, we were called to bring people into the church. We were called to bring people in that path with us. And so here it says that we're qualified because we're ministers of reconciliation. We're new creations. We're the righteousness of God. Therefore, we're qualified. And something should stir us up to the place, come on, where we continue to reach. And, you know, here at the Live Church, we see it on a constant basis. We have groups so that people connect. We go to the world. It's incredible. Pastor Walt's vision to, to impact and do campuses in other cities and that kind of thing. And, and we function in that on a daily basis. But what if every single person in here, come on, decided, and this is just a question, what if every single person in here today decided, you know, my life, God, God changed my life. He's anointed my life. It's time for me to step up my game. And I want to be available to the lost. I want to be a voice to the lost. I want to be a light to the lost. Listen to me. So there's an answer that somebody needs, and it might be in the workplace. It might be at the, be at the softball fields. It might be at the baseball fields. And I know I'm not firing you up this morning with a lot of stuff because this is a part of, of what we're supposed to do. But if you will begin to be obedient to the Holy Spirit and release what he's put in you, come on, to help somebody else, it'll be just like that boat. Come on, when it fires up, come on, it's going to make the sound and go to the places that it's supposed to go to. And that's what God wants to do in your life when you begin to release that and a lot of times we don't realize when, God, when God's speaking to us, you know, you're, you're like, hey, should I, call, should I call this person? Hey, I kind of want to buy these person's groceries at the grocery store. You know, I went to the, to the gas pump a couple of days ago, and I heard somebody come up and buy $3 worth of gas. And part of me was like, you know, I, wanna, I ought to go over there and just fill their car up. I didn't do it because I didn't want to embarrass, but that was God speaking. You know, the devil ain't going to tell me to do that, right? And so it's, it's that sensitivity to being available to help somebody else. That's part of, part of being the voice in the light. Are you with me here this morning? He says here that we're ministers of reconciliation. And, and I love the way that that scripture is phrased. All things are of God. Somebody say of God, who has reconciled us to himself. To who? To God. God has reconciled, him, reconciled us to himself, which means we're in right standing. We're in a good place right there. But he didn't do it just so that he could sit and hold us. He did it so that he could send us out. He could release us, come on, to be an impact and be a light to this world that we live in. And then he said, I love the way it says here, and he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is an honor. And so as we operate in the gift and the callings that God's put on your life, and for some, he's called you to be plumbers or teachers or nurses or doctors. That's the expression you flow in in life. And so whatever you do in life, how many of you know it's still an opportunity to bring reconciliation to the world? 
If you go to Olive's Nursery, come on, you're going you're to feel some Jesus and some Christmas and some, some seasons in there and some celebrations in there. If you, you know, and so it's a part of the expression of, of being able to, to take what's in me and give it away. Come on, not in a building on Sunday morning. This is a pep rally right here so that we can go change the world as the Life Church. <laughs> Connecting people with God's purpose, right? And so we're all ministers of reconciliation. Number two, number two, God gives you a compassion for other people. People matter to God. People matter, matter to us. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36 says that, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion because they were weary, they were scattered like sheep with no shepherd. And so he was moved with compassion. That word compassion means to suffer together. And so, yeah, I remember there was a time in, in, in back when I lived in, in Central Texas where I had a guy named uh, Gilbert McCain, great guy. He's, he's gone on to be with the Lord now. But he, I was working at this Sears, uh, uh, delivering furniture for Sears, and he came to me, and, and, and I had a break there, and so we went in the back, and he's probably about 50 years old then. Anyway, he was just broken and crying and, I mean, just internally struggling. And, and he said, he said uh, Pastor David, he said, uh, I just found out my son's addicted to heroin. And he said, uh, he said it don't look good. He's been making bad decisions, and, and, you know, he's in deep. I don't know what we're going to do. And he told the whole story. I mean, the guy was messed up. Somebody say messed up. I don't mind messed up people. Come on, somebody. And neither does Jesus, right? He was messed up. And so through the process, I looked at him and I said, well, I don't have all the answers today, Gilbert. I said, one thing I do know, that, that if two or more are gathered in his name, there he is. And I said, and if we come together in agreement and pray together, I said, I just believe, come on, that God's going to intervene and God's going to do something in this young man to turn his life, to spin his life, because it ain't what it looks like. It's about what God can do. And it don't matter how messed up, you know, all people matter to God. And so through the process, I prayed with him. God began to move. And within, I'm telling you, within three weeks, this young man went through the treatment, ended up getting off of drugs, and he became the biggest awesome bass player in our church. Come on, within six months with the testimony. And, 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 but there was a compassion to walk through the process with him. And, and, and it was just incredible to see the change. And so we, we also are called to have compassion for others. How many of you know there's mature Christians, but there's also some immature Christians? And then there's also some lost. Are you with me here today? And, and we've got to, we've, my dad used to say, you've got to be wise as a serpent and gentle as a dove. And so how can I change someone if I take such a hard stance on the front end? Come on. And I can't, I can't help move them. That's what the, the scripture says, that Jesus was moved with compassion. So there's sometimes you hear stories and, and you're like, man, that's a bad situation. But it should move us into some kind of action and some kind of compassion. Come on, somebody, that if somebody's messed up, there's still hope in Jesus. And because and, discipleship, let me tell you, is a long journey. It's not an overnight journey. It's a long ups and downs type journey, right? We talk about it all the time. It took the disciples, Jesus, three and a half years just to get them where they were, and they still weren't quite there yet. You still love me? God loves messed up people. That don't mean he leaves us messed up, but God loves some messed up people. Read your Bible, right? God loves some messed up people. So in that it says that he, he was moved with compassion. And when he moved, moved with compassion, he didn't leave them like he found them. He walked them through the process. Amen. Number three, allow the Holy Spirit to lead you. Allow the Holy Spirit to lead you. I told you, told you all ago that, that, that you know, I, I had a friend one time that got saved and decided they were going to go to the bar and lead everybody to Jesus in the bar. They didn't know a whole lot, but they got enough of Jesus to realize they wanted to do something. The problem is they, they didn't really listen to the Lord in that, and so when they ran out into the bar, they ticked somebody off, they ended up beating them to the point where they ended up having to have brain surgery and all this other stuff. So listen to me. We are, we're spirit-led people, right? We function where God tells us to function. So I'm not saying, hey, give your life to Jesus and, and go head out into the middle of the darkest place and give it a shot. That's not what we're saying today. We're saying be available and be led by the Holy Spirit to let God touch and move somebody's life, right? And so, you know, Jesus was walking down the street and saw Zacchaeus in a tree. And something in him stirred to, to, to say, hey, get out of that tree, get down here, and let's talk. And so you're going you're gonna to operate in different ways. You may be, be sitting at home and God puts somebody on your heart. And, 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 and you're like, man, I should call these people. I said it a while ago, the enemy's not telling you to do that. 
There, I remember a guy named Manuel I knew years ago and uh, led him to the Lord. He was quite a bit older than I was. I was probably in my, my late 20s and led him to the Lord, and he had a lot of struggles with depression and different things, and I didn't hear from him for a while. And, you know, I'm always spirit-led when, when it comes to those kind of things because I just don't, well, don't want to go diving into people's business. You want to let God kind of open the door, preparing hearts and that kind of thing. But I was sitting at, sitting at home, and, and something just hit me so hard to say, hey, you need to call that guy. And so I immediately picked up the phone. I called. I said, hey, Manuel, how you doing? Thinking about you, praying for you, just seeing if everything's going okay. And the guy just breaks. This is, this is a, this, and not many of these stories. This guy just breaks, and he's crying. And he, said, and he said, Pastor David, I'm so glad you called. He said, when the phone rang, I had a gun to my head, and I was about to pull the trigger. See, when we listen to God, listen, we, we don't know what he's orchestrating in people's lives. We don't know what the Holy Spirit is, is moving to protect somebody or have their hand on him. And so have I, had I hadn't made that call, maybe that would have happened, maybe not. I don't know. But I know that when God told me to do it and I obeyed, come on somebody, the response was there was some kind of healing in that process. The good news is he didn't take his life. He'd get grounded in church. Come on, and he's probably still serving the Lord today. I haven't talked to him in years. But that's what God does. And when we're spirit-led, somebody say spirit-led. It puts us in those kind of positions where we're able to respond. And, and listen, we're, we're, we're called to be partners together with God, come on, to reach people. And, 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 and you know, I was, I've, I've just been, been trying to feed along with some of Pastor Walt's uh, heart and vision in this thing, move the, moving the church forward, uh, uh, you know, over the next six months, eight months. And we've taken some steps in this thing. But can I, can I say something to help us as a church in this? If we're spirit-led, we're connecting people with God's purpose, listen, you, you, I'm, I'm going to encourage you to respond in those moments. As a church, when God puts somebody on your heart, respond. When, when, when God puts somebody in your path, if, if, if you feel that unction, if you miss it, you miss it. But I'm telling you, be available in those moments because you never know. You know, that guy, Manuel, he, he was a beat-down guy, man. And God spun his life turned it around. Before long, he was one of them front row, come on, church clappers. Are you with me? And, and that's what the Holy Spirit does. He takes us into places, and, and sometimes it, it's not pretty. And so the reason that we, we don't want to reach people sometimes is just because we don't want to deal with a lot of the messes that come with it. If we're going to disciple people into the direction, if we want them truly to be connected in God's purpose, how many of you know that when we, we have to lay down our lives and follow Christ, which simply means that we're available for anything he wants to do. And there's times it's not going to be fun. There's times that it's going to be outstanding. The feeling of leading somebody to Jesus is incredible. There's probably not a greater high on the earth, but it's also a process, come on, of walking people through it. But I, I encourage you to do it. And so my last thought today is, is get connected to the point to allow your faith to begin to operate where, you, where we bring people to church, where we bring them into salvation. We walk alongside of them. Are you with me here today? And, and, and the Lord spoke this to me yesterday, and, and I know it was God because I'm not smart enough to get thoughts like these on my own, right? But, but I know it was God, and he said, if, 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 if we'll get to a place in our lives, and maybe he was just talking to me, where church isn't a possession, where church is a partnership, then people will run, come on, to Jesus. Can I say that? Je Jesus, this is a partnership. We're, we're partners together. We're members set in the body. Come on, we, we died, we belong to Jesus, but Jesus never treats us like a possession. Are you with me here today? You know, I grew up in the church, so I know, I know a lot of the thought process in life. It's just easy. A lot of people get married, and they look at their husband as a possession. Their wife is a possession. A lot of times we get in church, and we think, this seat is my possession. Come on, if you grew up in the old days especially, come on, you, you have some seats you didn't touch. Come on, somebody. They'd be like, rrr, rrr. <laughs> I mean, they'd wound up on you. It wouldn't be pretty either. Don't touch my seat. Come on. When I was a senior pastor in, in Central Texas, I would change where I sit every Sunday on purpose. Come on, just to try to blend us out of that, that moment, that, that, that kind of thinking. But, but this is this incredible partnership is what the church is built on. Where two or more are gathered, come on, there he is in my name. When we pray together, when we seek first the kingdom of God, we're all in partnership together. Come on, with the King of kings and Lord of lords. And so part of the foundation of our church is to reach people. Come on. So if somebody wants our seat, come on, what do we do? Hey, we make room for the lost. 
we make room for the lost. And, and, and that's what the vision's about. When Pastor Walt says connecting people with God's purpose, part of what he's saying is we're doing these things, we're moving in these cities, we're going to these nations and these villages and these places, and we're making room for the lost. Do you want to know why there's a seat in here for you today, church? It's because somebody paved the price in a different generation to make sure that you had a place today to worship God together. And so, but if it becomes our possession, and, 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 and I really feel strong about this in my spirit, it's so easy to become possessive and, and think, hey, that's my seat, that's my building, that's my, I want worship to be this way, I want this to happen this way, before long churches just become another possession in our lives. But when church, come on, becomes partnership with Jesus, and, ch- and being a part of bringing people into that arena to say, hey, we've made room for you. You can have my seat. You can have my place at the window up front. Come on, you can work in the nursery. You can work in the coffee bar. You can go on a missions trip. You can do something. If we'll have that desire in our lives to be that kind of, kind of, kind of place, which we are, just taking it to a whole other level, what if we made room for somebody else individually? Is there room for the lost? Is there room for the lost? Is there room for the lost? And I'm not talking about seats. Is there room for the lost? Come on. If if somebody walks in today with a broken marriage, can we help them? I say we can. If somebody walks in today and they're crippled in their body, come on, do we have the faith to pray, to see that God can walk them through that process? Uh, are Are we willing and available to give up our seat? If the building was so packed today, come on, and there were no seats in the place, how many of us would rise up and say, hey, I'll make room for the lost? And so when Jesus was going through the process and God sent him to, to, to deliver us, Jesus made the decision, hey, I could sit here right now, me, full of the kingdom of God. But he didn't stop there. Jesus made the decision that, hey, I am making room for others. I am making room for others. And when he laid down his life, it, it wasn't just so that he could be popular. Come on, somebody. When he laid down his life, it's because 2,000 years later, over 2,000 years, he had you on his mind. And he's still functioning today. I encourage you, church, let's partner together. Let's partner together to see God do something bigger in our city. Let's partner with the vision, come on, that Pastor Walt's given us to connect people with God's purpose. Let's see every youth reach. Come on, somebody. Let's see marriages restored. Let's see God operate in a whole different mantle. Let's see the Holy Spirit move and be open. Come on. And I'll say this. Let's make room for the Spirit and let's make room for the lost. You want to move a God, there it is. You make room for the Spirit, let's make room for the lost. But it requires partnership. And so, you know, there's an old story in 1904 at the World's Fair in St. Louis. There were two two men sitting at a, uh, a tent. One was selling hot waffles. The other selling ice cream. 105 degrees. And so nobody's buying hot waffles because it's 105 degrees, right? And so the, the guy with the, the ice cream starts selling ice cream like crazy. And so the line kept filling up. Anyway, the guy runs out of bowls, and they're just circling through the process, and, and, and they're trying to wash bowls, give another deal out to get more ice cream. I mean, 105 degrees, you probably want some ice cream too, right? And so this, the guy's sitting over there not selling any hot waffles, and so he looks at him, and he had an idea come to his mind, and so he sees they're out of bowls. So the guy with the hot waffles runs over to the guy that's selling the ice cream. He wraps up his waffle cone. Come on. He scoops up some ice cream. He throws it in the waffle cone, and they begin to pass these out. And that day, listen to me, church, ice cream cones became famous in America. That was the starting point. wasn't the first one, but listen to me. What, the, what I'm trying to say to you today is the divine power of partnership can change the world. And you take this man's gift with this man's gift and you put them together. Come on. And before long, Jesus is famous all over our city, all over our nation, all over our groups. Come on, somebody. And so I encourage you today to take a stand. I, didn't, I, I knew I wasn't preaching a pretty message today, but I, do want, I, I want us to see the divine power of partnership and what God can do. There are people in our city, I believe a year from now we can look up and look at the people that we had the opportunity to bring into the church. Can we make room for those? Can we make room for those? And so stand your feet with me this morning. Lift your hands to heaven. Father, we thank you that you came to seek and to save those who are lost. And Father, as a church, we we believe today and we thank you for what you've given us. And we thank you for every single person in this place. Father, we don't take any need lightly. But we know that you're the need meter. 
But Father, we just, we just ask you to speak. I ask you to speak individually to each and every person. What are you asking me to do? What are you calling me to do? How, how can I be a part of being a minister of reconciliation? I want to be a part of the, pro, the, 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 the heart of God. I want to be a part of the, the partnership. Can I say that? We're partners in Christ Jesus. And through this partnership, I believe, Father God, there's divine things that you have that are going to take place of people getting saved and people getting discipled and coming through the pipeline the way that you want them to, Father. And I ask you to stir us up individually today to say, I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of that. I want to be a partner in this with connecting people with God's purpose. And I don't want to be a possession man. Come on, somebody. I want to be a partner with people and with you, God. If that's you today and you just want that in your life, I just think you just receive it right there where you're at. Father, I ask you to give them fresh connections, fresh starts, fresh, fresh ideas on how to hear from you. And Father, we ask you for some divine moments that people who are hurting, come on, that need us. We ask you for some divine moments, Father, where you just speak to us along the way. Put people on our hearts. Let us be sensitive to you. And Father God, no matter what they look like, no matter if they're hurting, no matter where they're messed up, Father, we believe that you can turn all things around. And so we ask you right now just to begin to have some setups along the way. That as we partner together as the Life Church, I just declare, come on somebody, that our church is going to triple in salvations alone. And Father, that as the light shines and we make room for the lost and we make room for your spirit, we just declare, Father God, that you have some special setups in our community. And as we take those steps, we declare all people matter. People matter to God. People matter to us. And we thank you for that today, Father. We declare it in Jesus' name. And we call it done. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.